from 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Conventional wisdom suggests the midterm election could be a strong one for Republicans nationally as President Joe Biden's poll numbers are lagging. But what about in Rhode Island where the GOP has struggled to get a foothold? Relative to Democrats, the Republican Party has been fairly quiet in putting up candidates in the Ocean State. With the clock ticking, what is the GOP's plan for 2022? Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi here to talk about that and so much more as a brand new executive director of the Rhode Island Republican Party, Jesus Solorio. And we welcome back Sue Sienke, chair of the Rhode Island GOP. Um, Jesus, welcome to, to Rhode Island. Well, thank you for the invitation and for having us. Uh, look, we wanted to have you on because uh, you just stepped into the role. You're from Illinois, where, just going through your bio, you were active in politics. You had an unsuccessful run for Congress. You've come to Rhode Island, which is a deep blue state where Republicans have traditionally, you know, traditionally struggled. Why did you take the job? Well, when I heard that the chairwoman was looking for an executive director, I submitted my resume, went through the interview process, um, and it's because I saw that there's a, a huge opportunity here in Rhode Island this cycle. I mean, you have the statewide legislative seats that, uh, you know, when I found out that there was only 10 Republicans in the legislature, uh, or 15 total, I knew that there was massive opportunity. And we're seeing what's going on at the national level. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, Democrat, or Independent, you're upset and you're frustrated with what's going on. And so I believe that that's going to really help the Rep Republicans here in Rhode Island. What do you see, and I'll get to Sue, I have a question about the General Assembly actually uh, to you, Sue, but um, before we get to that, what do, you, what do you see holding Republicans back uh, in Rhode Island, besides the obvious that you know, there are a lot of Democrats here? Well, I think both parties have a, a lot of issues they have to deal with internally, uh, but I, I think that, again, the excitement and enthusiasm is going to allow us to really come together and take on the... Uh, 80 plus years of democratic control here in the state. So as he said, Sue, merely um, 10 of 75 state reps mm -hmm. uh, and five of 38 state senators at the state house are Republicans. There are no announced Republican candidates for governor, treasurer, or secretary of state as we talk here right now. When you talk to people who are thinking about running or decided not to maybe, what is the biggest thing holding them back? You know, I think that people that are unaware of the political process, they think that they can do it. They think that they need special skills to run for office. We had training last week and we had a room full of people. Um, there was excitement, there was enthusiasm. And once they know what it takes, that it's every average everyday people that can jump in and we will hold their hand through the entire process. They feel much more confident that we have a structure in place that's going to help them succeed and win. And that's our job, to make them win the office that they're running for. Are you seeing an uptick in uh, enthusiasm to run versus 2020 or 2018? Huge uptick in enthusiasm. There's a frustration in what's going on. You know, you see inflation that's killing people. You see what's happening in the schools. You know, I, I say the one good thing that came out of COVID is that people started paying attention. They were home and they were much more involved in the process, particularly in the school area. We see that across the country, that people and parents in particular were actually paying attention to to what their children were learning in school and they were upset and they wanted to partake in the process so we're seeing an enormous amount of enthusiasm particularly in the school board races um, and then in the general assembly let's talk about some of the big races this year and you alluded to it jesus I'll, I'll go with you first in this one in the race for governor there's still no kicked off republican candidate but we have been hearing about this i'll admit somewhat mysterious gubernatorial candidate ashley kalis who uh she was in the medical industry uh, she moved to rhode island in the last year according to public records she hasn't talked to reporters yet but she has filed with the board of elections you told the pro you know ashley kalis um is she part of why you took this job and what can you tell us about her? Well, she was actually the one that informed me about the role. And mm -hmm. so, like I said, I submitted my resume, went through the whole interview process. Um, I am sure that she has an announcement coming soon. Um, but, you know, the role of the Republican Party is to build up the infrastructure, not only for statewide candidates, but all the other legislative and school board candidates. Um, and so going back to the, the training that we had this weekend, as a newcomer, um, I, what I kept hearing this entire week was like we haven't seen that enthusiasm. We haven't seen the number of candidates step up and uh, 
announce or have intentions to run for office. And I think that's, that's a great thing that we're seeing currently. Uh, so same question. I know you've talked to Ashley Kalis. I've asked you about this before. Jesus suggests an announcement is coming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're going to be around this watching day. Maybe you're hearing her name for the first time. What, uh, what do you see as her potential if she's going to be your standard bearer? Yeah, no, I see her potential. She's she's a former CEO of a medical company, which you indicated. So she's got the skill set that we were looking for. Of course, we were always looking for someone, a CEO type, that could come in and turn the state around. So she's got that skill set. She's um, a female candidate, which is always something good and different for the Republican Party to put someone you know, with a different skill set in front of uh, the uh, voters. So I think that, you know, as, as people learn, she's making her way around the state, talking to people. Um, they're very impressed with her. When do you think she'll kick off? Hopefully this month, yes. Hey, Zeus, um, Stu brought up education uh, in her first answer, and I was going through your campaign website when you were running for the 4th Congressional District in Illinois, and under the policy section, you had very high up criticism criticism of uh, race conscious teaching in schools and you also pointed to the Virginia gubernatorial victory for the GOP where Glenn Youngkin really leveraged education in his path to victory is that the blueprint you see employing in Rhode Island races well I think the frustration is there and it's palpable parents are upset and they're seeing that not only are the kids being taught um, you know, extreme curriculums, but they're also not being prepared for either post-secondary education or the workforce. And so these parents are fed up, and that's why we, we saw the, um, the gubernatorial race in, in Virginia and their statewide win, and I think that we're going to translate that energy here in Rhode Island. I mean, parents are fed up. They want their kids to be educated, and they want their kids to be prepared, but unfortunately, we're not seeing that across the country. I also, just going through your history, uh, noticed on February 18th you tweeted, uh, quote, Hispanic voters are leaving the Democratic Party in droves, and then you link to an NRCC poll suggesting the party's making uh, inroads uh, with uh, Latino and Hispanic voters. Your family emigrated from Mexico, correct? Correct. Um, and your bio mentions you were chairman of the Republican National Hispanic Assembly of Illinois. Why do you see that trend happening that the NRCC polled about? Well, it's not only the NRCC, but the Wall Street Journal just came out this morning. 56% of Hispanic voters are upset with Democrats. And we're seeing that trend uh, from, from the 2016 election until now, that Hispanic voters want the same thing as every American. They want safe communities, they want jobs, and they want great education. And unfortunately, Democrats have not delivered on that. And that's why uh, the Republican Party is really uh, gaining a lot of support within the Hispanic community and other minority groups as well. Sue, so, um, got to ask you about the other big uh, statewide, sort of statewide race, which is the second congressional district race. Um, you know, we see sort of a mix of analysis here where there's an opportunity that we may not usually see for Republicans in Rhode Island in a congressional race, but still not easy to win when Joe Biden won that district uh, fairly easily in 2020. Uh, you know, right now you have three candidates seeking the GOP nomination, Alan Fung, Jessica De La Cruz, Bob Lancia. And I have talked to folks who said it seems like the Republicans would be better off with, you know, uniting behind one candidate, letting them go in clean, not having like fighting about who moves to the right, et cetera, and taking on whichever Democrat emerges from their big primary. Are you concerned about that? No, I'm not concerned about that. I think it's, we have three terrific candidates and that uh, creates enthusiasm. You know, it doesn't have to mean that the party is fractured. I mean, I think there are seven different candidates currently that have uh, put into the race on the Democratic side. I think we're up I, to eight, actually. Actually, yeah. 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 today, eight, maybe tomorrow. But the eight be is nine. exploratory, so we'll <laughs> give it to you. Maybe yeah. nine tomorrow. So I think it's good for people to see that we have a strong um, farm team that is out there and willing to step so, up to the place. You wouldn't rather have uh, the Democrats beat themselves up in a primary, save, have the, a candidate in the Republican Party save their money as that is going on. You want that, all, and, and all of them pulling each other to the right? No, I, That's what I, you want to see? No, <laughs> no I, I think it's a good thing to see three different candidates. I don't think it's, it's a negative thing, and it also gives them the availability to be out in the press, to be able to talk to the press. You may not pay attention to the Republicans if there was not three people in the race. You'd be so focused in on the Democratic side. So it gives us an opportunity to, to be uh, right in front of the press all the time. Yeah. While we're talking about candidates, do you expect, so you have 
sounds like you both think Ashley Kalis will get in, so that's a candidate for governor. Um, I know someone's filed for LG. Uh, Chaz Galinda is running for AG. Do you expect to have candidates for uh, treasurer and secretary of state? Yes, yes. Do you have names in mind? I have names in mind. Whether Can you or say not, them? Yes. No, I'm not going to say them yet. <laughs> I'm not going to do that to somebody. But I, I expect to have somebody in those races. And the, and the filing deadline's June. Do you, yes. So when do you think we'll hear? Hopefully before June. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for narrowing that down. Um, all right. Well, speaking broadly of the Republican Party, start with you, Jesus. Is the Republican Party the party of Donald Trump? Look, I think the Republican Party is a very diverse party. It, even in Rhode Island, depending on where you're at, there, there's so many diversity within the Republican Party. And right now, what voters are focusing on is how to turn around Rhode Island and how to elect the right candidates into office. Yeah, but address the Donald Trump uh, part of the question here. I mean, he looms large over the party, doesn't he? Yeah, and he's brought in a lot of people that otherwise would have never paid attention to politics. And so right now, the focus is 2022 and, get, and getting everyone to come out and vote and support our candidates. Should he, should uh, Donald Trump run in 2024? Well, I think I would leave that to, to President no, I'm Trump. No, I'm asking you as the executive director of the Republican Party in Rhode well, Island. Well, I would leave that to President Trump, and, and I know he's, uh, he's out there publicly um, figure, figuring out if he's going to run or not. But again, our focus is 2022 and making sure that we get our uh, candidates elected. Well, Sue, on that question, I mean, you talk to a lot of Republicans in your role, as, as do you, I'm sure, Jesus. You know, what? what is the feeling among rank-and-file Republicans that we know Trump is still generally popular in the party, I think polling shows that, but do you hear we want him to run again or more we appreciate what he did and maybe we want a new face? Yeah, I think that's a mixed bag. You know, I think that what our focus is on who is currently in the office, I know that Donald Trump t takes up space in a lot of the media's heads, but we're not focused in on that. We're focused in on what can we do in 2022. And we're focused in on who is the current office holder of the presidency right now. It is not Donald Trump, it is Joe Biden. And we're focused in on what policies and procedures that he has put in place and where the country is now. You know, we want as Republicans and certainly as Americans, we want America to succeed. We want it to be a place where there's opportunity for certainly immigrants to come into this country and be successful. What is the American dream? And is that American dream still available for our next generation? And we start to see that slip away on a lot of different levels. So what we're focused in on is who holds the office now and what are we going to do in 2022 to make sure that America does be the shining well, light on the hill just again. We're running short on time, but I do have to ask you about one thing, which is uh, you voted against a resolution at the Republican National Committee, uh, which was rebuking Liz Cheney and Adam Kinsinger, the Congress people, for supporting the January 6th committee. Obviously, you were in the minority in your party in voting against that. Why did you take that vote? Well, I took that vote because there was certain language in there that I didn't agree with. Certainly, I don't agree with the way that the structure of the January 6th committee and um, is operating. They have no legal representation for the minority party with the Republicans. Um, I did not agree with Liz Cheney and Adam Kitzinger um, going around the process and procedure and not allowing Kevin McCarthy to place who he thought was appropriate on there. Just because we're short on time, then why did you vote for it? Why did you vote against it? That, that is exactly why I voted against it, because I just thought that the focus should have been on the January 6th and not highlighting individuals on that, but really focus in on what the January 6th committee is doing and how they are exceeding their authority. Sue Sienke, chair of the Rhode Island Republican Party and executive director of the Rhode Island GOP, Jesus Solario. Again, congratulations on well, the job and welcome us. to Rhode Island. It's an election year. I am sure we're going to be having you back. <laughs> I will be happy. <laughs> All right, great. When we come back after a hospital merger was halted, what is next for Lifespan? Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Last week, we heard from the head of Care New England after the proposed hospital merger was halted by Attorney General Peter Narona. Now, Ted Nisi talks to Lifespan President and CEO Tim Babineau about what's next for the hospital group. Dr. Babineau, thanks for taking a little time uh, to talk about uh, what transpired with the merger and, and what looms ahead. And let me just start um, just getting your basic reaction. Obviously, you wanted that merger to go through. When did you start to realize this might not go the way I want? 
Ed, Ted, good to be with you. Thank, thanks for having me. You're right. As, as you and I have talked over the years, you'll recall, Ted, I came to the state 14 years ago with the promise of this merger. So I've always believed in the vision. I still believe in the vision. I still believe it's the right thing for the state and the communities we serve. We, we were deeply disappointed uh, by both the FTC and the AG's decision. But to be honest with you, it really wasn't until we got the official word from both the FTC and the AG. I, I must say, I, I was caught a little bit off guard. I think a lot of people were caught off guard. We, we thought we made a very compelling case and we think the case you know, is still compelling. But it, I think it's three weeks ago tomorrow, we learned if I've got my dates correct. So it wasn't until we got the official word that we went, oh no. So I talked last week with Dr. Finale over at Care New England. He said, based on what the regulators said, he doesn't see any path forward for a lifespan Care New England merger. You just said you still believe in the vision of the merger, but practically speaking, is, is that idea dead at this point because of what they said? Probably a full asset merger is probably dead. Um, however, you know what, what's the old saying? Uh, when you run into a brick wall, find a way to go over it or go around it. So look, we're still going to work uh, with our colleagues at Karen and Wingman to see if there are things we can do together that don't require regulatory approval that could perhaps achieve part of the vision. Some people have suggested, you've been talking about full asset merger, meaning all of Lifespan with all of Care New England. There have been suggestions from people saying, okay, they've made it clear. You can't do roughly 80% market share. So get rid of a couple of hospitals and merge the smaller groups. I will say Dr. Finale did not sound interested in that. Do you have any interest in that? You know, we're not talking about that right now. He, he's made it pretty clear that that's not an option that he'd like to explore. So that's really not on the table at the moment. We're, we're trying to look at programs and other things we might do together. Research, research is still very much front and center as something we might be able to together. Uh, our faculty is doing things together, but I would say right now that option is not on the table. I, I do want to uh, go back to uh, sort of the attorney general's commentary. Um, I think um, p many people were uh, surprised by sort of how vociferous he was in criticizing the whole merger concept in his news conference um, that day. And I'm curious, one of the things he really seemed to to suggest was that there was, a, I guess I'd say, an arrogance on the side of the hospital groups not providing full information, sort of a, in his view, a trust us argument with a lack of full detail. How do you respond to that criticism? The idea you, you just didn't give enough information for what, what everyone agrees was a big, big transaction. Yeah, here's what I'll say, Ted. You know, I have enormous respect for the attorney general. I have enormous respect for his office. I have enormous respect for his staff. They work very, very hard on this application. Um, we were disappointed with the ruling. And yes, I was a bit taken aback, as you say, by the vociferousness, vociferousness with which he announced his decision. But he's the attorney general, you know, and, and, and that's his call. Um, we were a little bit surprised because, again, um, you know the process well. The application was deemed complete. So we took that as a signal. We did, in fact, provide the information that the attorney general needed. Clearly, he didn't feel that way. So there is, there is a little bit of a conflict there. But at the end of the day, you know, he's the attorney general and we respect him. And while we disagree with the decision, we respect his decision. Uh, Dr. Finale made clear to me, and it wasn't a surprise, I think, to most people, that Care New England still thinks it needs a merger partner before too long. As you said, its balance sheet is a concern, et cetera. Um, you know, the, with Lifespan, it's a little more unclear to people. You know, you're the bigger of the two organizations, but at the same time, uh, Dr. Paxton at Brown often points out that neither Lifespan nor Care New England is, is super big compared to some of the big, big organizations that other states have. When you look out, do you think Lifespan can um, survive and thrive as an independent organization roughly with the facilities it has now? Or do you think at some point Lifespan will have to bulk up by partnering up with somebody? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, right now, we're feeling pretty confident about our ability to remain independent for the next couple of years. Now, you know as well as anyone, the landscape changes so rapidly, and what's true today may not be true a year from now. But we're really focused on, again, the future and, and really paying a lot more attention to rebuilding our, our workforce. That's where our focus and our energy is going to be for the next several months, if not a year or two.
non-merger question uh, for you. So we've seen the number of COVID hospitalizations go way, way down from the peak in January, thankfully. It was now under 100, which we haven't seen since last summer. Um, can you paint a picture of kind of how you're feeling right now about the situation inside, particularly at Rhode Island Hospital, but across your hospitals um, as we get further away from that huge wave of Omicron cases? Yeah, Ted, it's a great question. You're, you're absolutely right. The Omicron, is, as was predicted, had a meteoric rise and thankfully a meteoric decline. It went up very rapidly. It went down very rapidly. Our numbers, when I looked uh, on Monday, we were under 15 inpatients across lifespan. Remember, we peaked at approximately 270. So it really, really has dissipated in terms of inpatient. That's the good news. The, the bad news, if you will, or the challenge going forward, if you will, is, and, and I, Ted, I, I hesitate to stretch a metaphor too far, given the atrocities that are going on in Ukraine right now, but we've been at war with this virus for two years, and that war now appears, thankfully, to be over. And like other wars, when the war is passed, you've got to focus on rebuilding. You've got to focus on rebuilding your town, your city, your organization. That's exactly what we're doing now. I am intensely focused on what I think is our biggest challenge and our biggest opportunity, rebuilding our workforce. Our workforce went through things that just nobody can comprehend, no one can comprehend. Right now, Ted, we have 2,400 vacancies at Lifespan, 2,400 job opportunities at Lifespan. And you'll see from this new ad campaign that we're launching this week that we're pretty excited about, we are really doubling down on recognizing the people who stuck with us during the pandemic and getting a message out there that healthcare is still a great profession, Lifespan is still a great place to work, we'd love to have you back, we'd love to have you join Team Lifespan. And Ted, that personally, that's where I'm going to be, be, be putting a significant amount of my effort disappointed about the merger. We'll continue to explore what else might happen in that space. But the organization leadership and myself as the CEO are going to be intensely focused on rebuilding the workforce. It, it, it's, it's challenge number one, number two, and number three for the next year or two. 2,400 positions. That's a lot of positions uh, in a state the size of Rhode Island. I mean, is it mostly nurses? Is it across the board? I mean, what? Uh, I know you can't go through all 2,400, but are there like big pockets where you really need people? Great question. It's across the board. It's across the board, right? And the good news is um, there's opportunities for virtually anyone who's listening to this broadcast, if you've got a high school education, if you've got a college education, if you've got a nursing degree, if you've got a pharmacy degree, we've got job openings everywhere. This is going to be your 10th year, I believe, uh, in this job, in that seat as CEO of Lifespan. How long do you see yourself doing this? You know, I've got the best job in Rhode Island. It, it's, a, it's a real privilege and honor. I love what I do. I love coming to work every day. I'm, I'm enormously proud of the care we deliver to the community. I'm enormously proud of our talented workforce, our doctors, our nurses. They're really extraordinary people. They energize me. Yeah, a good few for noticing. Uh, August 15th will be my 10th year anniversary as CEO of Lifespan. I don't have any plans to go anywhere as long as, as long as the board will keep me around for a few more years. I'm happy to be here. Dr. Timothy Babineau, a president and CEO of Lifespan, the interview was that on Wednesday? Did that Wednesday. On yeah. Wednesday with uh, Ted here. And you know, Ted, for people watching at home, we have a couple minutes left. The hospital merger falls apart and they, they kind of get the understanding that maybe Care Lifespan had, um, was on stronger financial footing than Care New England. And there might be a lot of people worried that now that this deal fell through, that the hospital's future are it's in question, right? And, and running a hospital is just so darn expensive. It is, and I think, you know, the first thing I'd say is obviously, I, you don't want people to be worried that you need to go to the hospital today or tomorrow and something's gonna be right. closed. They really don't think it's like that. But I do think that, especially in Care New England's case, as you said, Tim, it's very expensive to run hospitals. The investments you need to make in facilities, we just saw women and infants kick off a big fundraising mm -hmm. campaign. Um, and that's why you've seen now for years, Care New England trying to partner up with a larger organization in the hopes that that would make them bigger, more financially strong, and able to do that. And their CEO has said that they're gonna look at that again. Lifespan, as you heard there, is in a bit of a different situation. They are, of course, Rhode Island Hospital, Miriam, uh, uh, Bradley, and Newport. Newport. And 
you know, he feels like they can stay independent for a bit because of their significantly bigger than Care New England. But lifespan, too. Do they have to get bigger, you think? Well, and that's the question, right? You know, the idea of coming together with Care New England was they would have the full spectrum of services, but of course the Attorney General felt they'd be so big that uh, that would that would be problematic for competitive reasons. So does Lifespan need to add more services and things like that? Babineau said it's, it's too soon to decide that. But I just do think we're looking at you know, a, quite a few years here where some big decisions are going to be made. And those decisions are both in the hospital system, Sim, but also more broad kind of policy questions for Rhode Island and Rhode Islanders. Do, does the state need to increase how much it spends on Medicaid? We saw some state lawmakers talking about increasing those rates to put more money into the hospitals. Um, what does that mean for commercial health insurance? Uh, you know, in the end, the money for those hospitals has to come from somewhere, and it's going to be some combination of the government and private health insurance. And so I think you know, there, there's a lot in flux. I felt like the last decade was the decade of our hospitals in flux in Rhode Island, but yeah, it looks yeah. like we could have it maybe another decade or at least a number of years of it. All right, Ted Nisi with the hospital update there. If you missed our first half, it was with Jesus Solorio. He's the brand new executive director of the Ro Rhode Island Republican Party and Susie Yankee, chair of the Rhode Island GOP. If you missed it, it's on WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.